Thank you, Ken, for being here. Thanks for having me. Well, Ken, I uh, would like to start off by jumping right in to your book, Hollywood Ending. And you've been working on, or you worked on this story about Harvey Weinstein for years. And so how did you, could you take us back to that article, the first article that you wrote about Harvey Weinstein? And what, why was he on your radar as somebody you wanted to write about? Well, um, my beat at the New Yorker, Analyst of Communication, is write about media and media figures and profile people. And so we decided to do a profile of Harvey Weinstein, who in 2002, which is when I, the profile was reported and written, um, he was on top of the world. I mean, he had won Academy Award after Academy Award, nominated over 300 times his movies and actors and directors for Academy Awards. So he was a major figure and I wanted to explore that. I did not know about his abuse of women at the time. I knew about his abuse of staff. And the, and the profile, it was a 20,000 word profile in the New Yorker, described how he verbally abused staff, sometimes throwing ashtrays or cell phones at them, et cetera. But I got word in, in the latter part of, this is a four or five month reporting project I was doing. And I got whispers that he had raped a woman at the Venice Film Festival in 1998. And I had the name of the woman and the woman who came to her aid. Rowena Chu was the name of the woman he allegedly raped. And, and Zelda Perkins was her boss, his 25-year-old assistant in London. And I confronted Harvey in, a, in my final interview with him in a conference room, just the two of us. And I said, Harvey, tell me about raping, you raping Rowena Chu at the 1998 Venice Film Festival. He stood up from the conference table where he was seated and he stood over me and he, he's standing, I'm seated and he's clenching his fists and his lip is trembling. And he says, if you write that, it will destroy my family and shame my three teenage daughters. You can't write that, you can't write that. And at that point, thinking he was going to take a poke at me, I stood up to face him. Uh, so I wouldn't be, you know, in an enfeebled position seated. As soon as I stood up, he did something really extraordinary, surprising. He started to cry. And he basically denied the story. I tried to track down Rowena Chu. She was in Asia. I couldn't find her. I tracked down Zelda Perkins, his former assistant. She was in Guatemala and she refused to talk to me. The woman who had told me, who I've since have identified in, in my book as a producer of, of Shakespeare in Love, which is the movie they were doing then, she would not go on the record. So I had no one confirming this was true and I had Harvey Weinstein denying it. So the New York decided properly that we couldn't run this story with on the National Enquirer. Uh, we asked him the tough question. He, he denied it and we had no one confirming it. Uh, so we couldn't write it. But I knew he was guilty and I knew he had abused women. What I learned later is he did not actually rape Rowena Chu, which is what I was told. He attempted to rape her and she escaped. So. In 2015, which was the first time, it's really shocking, over 100 women over four decades subsequently came out and said Harvey Weinstein abused them. But never was it publicly exposed in the press until 2015, when he assaulted an Italian model. She went to the police. They apprehended Harvey. But the, and I tried to get the story then, but then the DA decided he couldn't prosecute, he would lose the case. So they didn't prosecute and I couldn't write the story then. And then he was exposed in, in, 2000, in the fall of 2017 by three brilliant reporters, the two New York Times reporters who wrote later wrote, wrote about that, but then wrote a book called She Said, an excellent book, and Ronan Farrow for The New Yorker who also exposed him both in October of, of 2017. My decision to write a biography of Harvey Weinstein, I, I was different than, than their decision. 
they were exposing this monster and they did a brilliant job of doing that, which they won Pulitzer Prizes for, deservedly. I was, was haunted by the mysteries. What made this powerful man do what he did to women? What, what explained it? Was there a cause? Was there something that happened in his childhood? What was his childhood like? What was he like? When did he first start abusing women? What was the nature of his power? And how, 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 did, he, how did he accrete that power? And how did he abuse that power? What was, why, if he was doing this for four decades, was there a culture of silence? Why did no one come forth and expose him for the monster he was? And lastly, I was fascinated by the relationship between he and his brother, Bob, two years younger. They were equal business partners. And in the end, in 2017, Bob Weinstein supplied the vote to fire his brother from the Weinstein company. So that relationship over all those years was one that fascinated me as well. So we're really looking back at 20 years ago is when you published that article. And it was really the, the beginning of uh, your exploration, not only of him, but you've explored the, the wielding of power, the abuse of power of other people and institutions. I mean, this the culture of silence that you reference and is a part of the subtitle of your book is is an institutional abuse that has the complicity of people that some of us who are on the outside looking at Hollywood, we think of directors, um, actors, actresses, people who participate in humanitarian causes that's, that people care about, politicians, Weinstein's connection to the Clintons. Uh, when you were trying to, when you were writing your book, how did you uh, assemble this? It's almost like a galaxy of people and keep it consistently organized because it's almost like you're the big stage director. I, I see you like making sure that somebody's entering and exiting properly. But the whole through line is Harvey's abuse of power and the choices that people around him make to facilitate that. How did you make those choices? Well, I, I probably interviewed th roughly 300 people for the books, many like Bob Weinstein, the brother, many, many times, uh, probably a dozen interviews with him alone. I tape most of my interviews, uh, unless the person would object, but I, I usually won't let them object. I, I wanna have that, that tape recording. Uh, and after I do an interview, I, I take voluminous notes and I have the tape on. I then go back to my computer. I'm sitting at one right now. And I, I create an index. And in that index, I, I write, I, I put the name of the person, colon, what, and then I put the headline of what they said. And then I, I put next to it the notebook. And I, 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 I numerically, I, my alphabetically name my notebooks A, B, C, D, and then put the page number afterwards. And if it's a document, I do it numerically. Uh, and if it's a book, I do it Roman numerals. And at the end, I had a 600 page single spaced index. And it's a very laborious and boring process I go through. But in the end, it allows me to get to master the material and almost be able to write without looking at my notes, though I do. And then as you're looking at this index and studying it at, at the end of the reporting, you then start shuffling things like a deck of cards and you figure out what is your narrative. Uh, you know, what, what you've done is you put things in, in different categories. It may be opening scene, maybe one category, and you have multiple choices for that. Another is Harvey's childhood. You have, multi, you have all that material. Then he, he goes to University of Buffalo, you have that material. The start of his company, Miramax, you have that. And as you interview people, you, you write down separately questions you want to be sure to ask either the brother or a classmate in in Queens growing up or a classmate at Buffalo. And so you have all this material and you start shuffling it like a deck of cards. 
as you think about what your narrative structure of the book will be. And, you, and then as you write the book, you split the screen on your, I have an IMAX, so it's a very large screen, and half the screen is my index and half is what I'm writing. Oh. So as I go through the index and I have all my materials and boxes behind me, I then put a check mark after I use something from the index. But, but, and, but that, that index, that boring process of doing it was, is one of the most important things you do in order to conquer the material and get on top. Well, I, you just got a master class, folks, audience members, that because that's an amazing behind the scenes way to deal with such a complex set of individuals and interviews and material. Um, when you were when you go back and interview people a second, a third, a fourth time, how do you convince them to talk to you again? They have to, you have a body of work here that's really, I don't think you are are known or have a reputation for being brutal or unfair, but I think you're going to make you're going to report you're a trained journalist and some people are very unhappy with the unvarnished truth as it appears in your articles and your books how do you convince people or why would people talk to you again and again well first of all they talk to you initially of course they want to get their side of the story out or they're curious um and i don't i don't approach them as a prosecutor I don't say I'm, I'm here to beat you up. Uh, I'm here to embarrass you. And I'll often start with questions which, which have become very valuable piece of information for me. Tell me about your life. Tell me about your, your biography. And, and people like talking about themselves. And, and it's, but it happens to be a very valuable insight you gain about, about them as you're doing that. And then when you go back the second, and, and so, if I know I'm going to interview people multiple times, uh, the, the, at the first interview, I'm not asking the punch in the nose questions. The second interview may be the punch in the nose question. And by that point, they're invested and they want to protect themselves and, and want to give you uh, an answer that, that explains their behavior, excuses their behavior, uh, blames someone else. Um, and, you know, they may try and go off the record. And, and at that point, you say, sorry, you know, this is this is on the record. But personality matters. You have to make people comfortable. And, and, and if you don't make people comfortable, if you go in like that prosecutor I mentioned, people are not going to talk. They're not going to open up. They're going to be fearful and understandably so. But if, if your task is to try and understand, which is what my, I believe my task is, then you're asking not gotcha questions, which is often a complaint about the press, but you're asking, let me understand questions. And people want to understand. I mean, I, I've always, people always wonder, they say, why did Rupert Murdoch or Jack Welch agree to spend so much time talking to you for you, for Murdoch for a profile and Jack Welch for one of my books? Um, and, and the answer is they think, they're good at what they do and they want the world to know it. And if they think someone is fair and has fact checkers, which we have at the New Yorker, you know, they, they, they will only take that chance. As an outsider, kind of having consumed Harvey Weinstein's career in the sense of a moviegoer, as a really avid moviegoer, and a lot of folks are, it was very disturbing to think about some beloved films that, you know, of course he had, he is tremendous skill and, and acumen and uh, almost a supernatural talent, the rare talent. What's, what's your take on how people's ambition seem to override their and their desire to be in Hollywood, to be in one of his films, to have the stardust on them, to have that stardust rub off on them. 
How, what's your take on that? There's the ambition and that desire on one side and then the ugliness of how he was abusing the people around him. Well, if you're an ambitious actor, director, screenwriter, and you're looking at, and, and let's say all the studios in Hollywood, including Harvey's Miramax studio, made a total of roughly 120 movies a year coming out of Hollywood studios. And the movies that Harvey's Miramax was making uh, were regularly winning Academy Awards and being acclaimed. Think about My Left Foot, Shakespeare in Love, The English Patient, Pulp Fiction. Think about the, the galaxy of movies this man brought to the screen. If you're an ambitious actor or actress, you want to be in one of his movies, which just enhances his power. And if you look, for instance, you go back to the criminal trial in New York, or you watch the one going on in, in Los Angeles today, uh, one of the obstacles that that the prosecution had in New York, and they had the same obstacle in, in California, is the women who are claiming that Harvey abused them sexually, nevertheless, in many cases, continued to keep in touch with them and ask him for favors and wanting to be. So clearly these were ambitious women who wanted to be in the Hollywood scene and the movie business, and, and Harvey was their ticket for that. So then the question becomes, why did these women continue to keep in touch with Harvey? And that was an obstacle that the, the prosecution had to overcome in order to find Harvey guilty, which he was found guilty in New York. Whether he will be in Los Angeles, it, it, the jury's out on that. Mm -hmm. But And one of the things you learn from the trial in New York, which I attended every day, was that they had a, a Barb, Dr. Barbara Ziv, who was a rape expert, at Temple University. She was on the witness stand for the prosecution. The prosecution knew, knew this was an obstacle they had to overcome. And they asked her, tell us about rape in America, Dr. Ziv. And she said the following, which was a stunning fact. She said 40% of the women in America who are raped continue to keep in touch and oftentimes have sexual relationships with the person who raped them. And then the question becomes why? And there are multiple answers to that. The women are in denial. Oh, I, 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 this didn't really happen. They blame themselves and therefore they don't blame Harvey. They don't want anyone to know about it, you know? Or they, they just, you know, they, they want a role in, they want to be in the movie business, uh, different things. The prosecution convinced the jury in New York, in the New York trial, that these were legitimate reasons, that these women, even if they were overly ambitious, and even if they made nice to Harvey and we feel they shouldn't have, nevertheless, he still raped them. And he's still guilty of that. Right. And, and, and that's, but it's very rare, it, it, historically, it's very rare that, that you prosecutors will bring rape cases when the women continue to keep in touch. In New York, they did bring that. And in Los Angeles, they bring that. And, and the result in New York is how we got a 23 year prison sentence. I imagine your book is going to uh, be of interest for a long time, but since she said the movie is coming out, I bet you that you're going to see another resurgence in the exploration mm -hmm. of this topic. And you all came at this subject from different angles and points in time and had a different focus but your relationship uh, your professional relationship with Ronan Farrow is is a part of the book and it's a part of the larger story too because he couldn't get that story on the air at NBC right he he was it, it was squashed and you you know he came to you and the two of you talked about that what your what your work had been and what your what the roadblocks have been for you what do you think uh, about the when we think of the culture of silence part of the culture of silence was a mainstream media coverage the inability of it to break through on a really high profile you know, news news uh, channel what it's that that can't be the only time that's happened we know just too many <laughs> <laughs> no, too many times when things have been squashed 
What's your interpretation of I mean, why think, FAIR couldn't do it? I, I think the press bears some uh, a significant measure of blame for not tackling the story of Harvey Weinstein and his abuse of women. And that's part of his power. He basically gave out gifts. He had talk books, which he created. And he gave book contracts to journalists and screenwriting contracts from his movie business to journalists. Uh, he had a, a magazine, Talk Magazine, which he also gave you know, opportunities for journalists. But he invited people to the screenings. He invited them, you can come to the party afterwards. Listen, it's off the record. If you see people taking cocaine, we don't want you to write that, you know? And the press complied with that. They were, they were inside the tent. And, and he got away with a lot and, yeah. and he shouldn't have. It, and, it was a real way to compromise people. I agree. And what happened with Ronan is Ronan came and interviewed me and I did not know him. And he told, I said to him at one point, he, he was very good in the questions he was asking. And, and at one point I said to him, so what have you got? And this is in July of 2017. He was then working for NBC. And he said, I've got, I've got three women on camera by name and their face saying that Harvey assaulted them. I have five women on camera, but shielded and their names blocked out saying that Harvey assaulted me. I have the audio tape of the Italian model who, who he assaulted in 2015, which is the first time it had ever gone public. And I said, my God, you've broken the case. I said, what's the next step at NBC? He said, I meet with the president of NBC News on August 8th of 2017. And so on August 9th, I called Ronan Farrow. I said, so how'd you do? I thought I was really thrilled. I was off doing a book on something else. And I thought, finally, this monster is going to be exposed. And Ronan said to me that the president of NBC News killed the project and, and fired me and said, we don't think it's news. We don't think you got the goods. And I said, oh, my God. So I... I then introduced Ronan Farrow to the New Yorker editor and, and he, he went to work there. And, and some weeks later, two months later, he produced an amazing story on, on Harvey Weinstein, which he had. And, and, nice. and so when I confronted NBC, they said they didn't have it. I then called the editor of the New Yorker, not the editor in chief, but the woman, Deirdre, who, who edited Ronan Farrow. I said, so Deirdre, what did Ronan Farrow bring to you when he came when he left NBC, because NBC said he only got this material after he left NBC. I said, what did he bring to you at The New Yorker? And she said, he brought me three women by name, five women unnamed, and the audio tape of the Italian model. So all the things he had for NBC that they denied he had. And so what do you think is the reason then that the that the president of NBC did not want to run it? Compromised in some way? Bought off? I, do you know? I don't know the answer. I, I, I pose five possibilities in the book. The president of NBC News, Noah Oppenheim, is a screenwriter. He's written two screenplays. Harvey was head of a studio. So if you're ambitious to be a screenwriter, you want to stay on his good graces. Maybe that's one reason. Second, his boss, the, the chairman of NBC News, Andy, Andrew Lack, was a social friend of, of Harvey's. Three, the CEO then of NBC, Steve Burke, was a studio head. They own Universal, and Harvey was a studio head. They often co-produce movies together, which is very common in, in, in Hollywood. Fourth, uh, Brian Roberts, the head of the parent company, Comcast, which owns NBC, is a personal friend of Harvey's. Uh, Harvey considered him part of what he called his, his uh, Martha's Vineyard Mafia. Harvey used to spend summers in Martha's Vineyard with his first wife. And the fifth reason, uh, theory, I don't know whether any of these are true, is that Harvey had information about Matt Lauer's sexual escapades at NBC, and he made a trade. If you don't write about me, if you don't report on me, I won't share the information I have about Matt Lauer. I don't know whether any of those are true. But those are the only plausible possibilities 
that might explain. I, I mean, their explanation is that he, Ronan Farrow didn't have the goods. I know that's false. Mm -hmm. So you're in now to a speculative field. And I, I, don't, I don't venture or hazard a guess as to why they did. I, I, but I, I do claim that they abused their power by not reporting us. I want to encourage the audience to please uh, post your questions in the chat or YouTube. You can log in and post a question there, or you can send us a question. We've already received some. You can send us a question via email to virtualqa at malaprops.com, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. So is, is this the first time, Ken, where you've really looked at a, a culture of silence and a level of compromised people and complicity and, and you know people are told oh if you have a problem or a complaint go to hr well that is just right. oh i don't think so but I mean, it's what do you what's your experience with this kind of culture of silence well, it, it, it's not a, a culture. My experience in terms of writing about sexual abuse is, is not extensive. But my experience in writing about power and, and the abuse of power and the fear that people have of those who are powerful runs through reporting I've done in my books. And I mean, you find in powerful organizations with powerful people at the top that the people who work for them basically often, you know, quiet themselves and don't venture a, a sharp opinion or a sharp disagreement. Um, and so if you write about power, you're, you're used to that. In Harvey's case, the cultural silence was so much more extensive than that and so much more damaging. I mean, people talk about, you know, well, isn't this typical of Hollywood, you know, the casting couch culture? And this, if you look historically through Hollywood, clearly powerful men were abusing women and, and making trades, sex for roles in movies, et cetera. But they weren't raping women. What Harvey did is criminal. And, 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 and ultimately, you, you know, he was held to account for that, and he should have been. So when you're thinking about also the role that politics plays in your story i think that's a that's a fascinating element too because you know, the connection of the clintons to harvey weinstein and his fundraising that he done and then of course fundraising for uh, you know humanitarian causes and the people who were connected to those as well and the way he could isolate someone or frighten somebody and give giving a, a an internship to president obama's daughter right. or to anna winter's daughter at at right. vogue the vogue editor uh, i mean he he harvey understood power and 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 part and if you had that kind of power people are afraid to buck you and and challenge you and harvey understood by the way donald trump is the same thing and, and they understand that key to power is fear. People have to fear you. And Harvey understood that and people feared him. And one of the reasons why there was this culture of power, people were terrified. He right. got women to sign non-disclosure agreement, paid them off and go, you're gone, get out of here. You know, and, and the press wanted the goodies he would give out, the stories he would give out, the gossip he would share. Um, so he and, and actors and actresses, you know, wanted his his favor. And if he would if he abused someone, many people still wanted their favor. I mean, Gwyneth Paltrow was abused in one of her early roles for Harvey, and she wound up doing nine or ten movies afterwards for Harvey Weinstein. And well, and you know, she was an ambitious, talented actress who wanted right. to be in good movies, and Harvey made good movies. And it paid off for her. I mean, you know, she won an Academy Award. I, I never forget when Seth MacFarlane made that joke, right. you know, about uh, now you now you don't have to act like you like Harvey Weinstein. And that right. was sort of to me when I used to watch those uh, those award shows. I thought, what is he talking about? You know, but it was it just seemed 
very strange and ran, you know, it was kind of a random comment. Right. right. It was an insider joke that was broadcast internationally. And I just thought, why would Seth, why would Seth MacFarlane, you know, in hindsight, be the one to, to make that such a public jab? He was a friend of a woman by the name of Louise Geis, who Harvey had abused. And and he was outraged by it. And the truth is, that's that's just an example of cultural silence. He knew, and other people in Hollywood knew, but it, until 2015, no one had ever publicly accused Harvey of sexual abuse. That's astonishing. It's think? like with Bill Cosby and the comedian who made the joke about Bill Cosby that went viral because they, you know, he's a, a rapist. He drugs and rapes women. And it was just somebody with their cell phone recording it. And then it goes viral and so, takes so many people aback. But it's that culture of silence that now we know so, so much more about. And I think uh, but one of the reasons why the culture is so strong of silence is, is fear. People are afraid. And, and Harvey could, could destroy me uh, is part of the motivation that those people had. When you think about people like Jeffrey Epstein, uh, you mentioned Donald Trump. Uh, people talk about Bill Clinton now in a different way and really perceive Monica Lewinsky in a quite different way. Uh, you've you've profiled a lot of people and you've looked at men like Harvey Weinstein, who and Rupert Murdoch, uh, all these men who wield tremendous power. Do in your research, did you find that they have any? commonalities or are they just unique individuals and in how they exercise power or abuse it I, I think ego comes into play here and, and when you're a powerful person um, often you become a narcissist and it's very common in terms of sex when you're surrounded by attractive younger women it's very common for you to confuse a compliment. Oh, Mr. Clinton, that's a wonderful speech. Oh, you're so good, Mr. Weinstein. I, I, I just love your movies. It's very easy for that narcissistic person to confuse a compliment with a come on and, 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 and to take try to take advantage of it. She really wants me. And so in Harvey's mind, he thought it was a fair trade he was making. These women wanted something from him. He wanted something from them and a rape is a criminal act you know they didn't want to be raped and he raped them. when when you were an observer in his trial in new york can you kind of set this set the stage what was it like to be there on a daily basis you know some people talk about what it was like to like dominic dunn talked about covering uh, the oj simpson trial there are people who have, were there from the beginning to end. What was it like? What was the atmosphere? And did you see his family, his daughters? Where, where Was anybody there? The like only that? person who came regularly for him outside of his lawyers and his PR man was his University of Buffalo friend, a retired doctor, William Correo. He came most days to the trial. None of Harvey's three daughters came his ex-wives, his current wife then, his second wife, they were not yet divorced, came. His brother never came. Uh, his friends didn't come. And so you're sitting in that courtroom and Harvey would had a walker. He was walking in his stenosis and, and he, would, he would come and he'd sit at the table, kind of disheveled, rough, gruff, beard-like on the face. And you'd look at him and he would often fall asleep. And, and the jury would be seated and they'd be staring at him and I'd be staring, watching him as, as the trial is unfolding. And the woman who came to testify, six women came to testify against Harvey claiming he had assaulted them. And they didn't want to look at him. And, 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 and the judge would say, and the prosecutor would say, do you see Mr. Weinstein in this courtroom? Yes. They looked this away and, and the prosecutor would then say, would you point to him please? 
And they would often point turning their head away. Their finger pointing to him, but their face not, not looking at him. It was quite amazing to witness that. But it was a, it was a, it was a room that contained about 120 people and probably half of those were reporters or 50 reporters and many reporters and um and they're oftentimes waiting lines to get in to watch this trial do you know about or have you heard uh, any information on his relationship with his daughters his relationships sure. with them as i report in the book his three daughters don't speak to him they just basically disowned him. Um, his ex-wife, his second wife, quickly divorced him after he was found guilty. His brother literally hasn't talked to him, you know, since since before the trial and, and, and to this day. And most of his friends are his former friends. And so Harvey's very alone. He has two younger children from his second wife. Uh, who he would see, and, and by the way, all the reports uh, I had in the reporting I did for the book claim that, that Harvey was a good father to his three young daughters from his first marriage and his two young son and daughter from his second marriage. But he's in LA, he was transferred from prison outside of upstate New York to LA to stand trial there. And so the kids, he doesn't see his, his kids. We talked about before <laughs> we started, me. that's okay, salud. Uh, we talked about before we started uh, tonight's event about this, um, about the idea of memoir. And I had asked you, would you ever write a memoir? And you, you had a definitive response and it seems to be grounded in <laughs> some of your experience in reading, I think too many bad memoirs. Could you, could you please tell the, tell the reason why sure. I, you're going to give this definitive answer? Ken, are you going to write a memoir one day? I, I, and I said earlier when we talked about, it, I said, no. And I said, there were a couple of reasons for that. One is that, I think you got to be a narcissist to do that. And, and I, hopefully I'm not that. Uh, two, um, you, in order to write a good memoir, you've have, you have to think that your, what you tell about your life reaches some larger point uh, that is instructive to the reader. I, one year I was a Pulitzer juror in the nonfiction category and I read, we got about 900 books to read and probably a third of them were memoirs. And almost without fail, they were awful. And they were awful because the, what the authors did, they assumed that I, as a reader, wanted to know about their life. They didn't assume that they had anything important in their life that would il illuminate something larger. It was all about me, 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 me. And, you know, so those are reasons I would not um, succumb to the, or I have no urge to write a memoir, nor to oh. write a novel. Oh, really? So, so it's all journalism, nonfiction. No, I, I mean, forever. for novels, it's a different reason. I don't think I would have the talent to create dialogue that way. Oh, really? All these interviews, these years of interviewing, you seem to be so skilled at eliciting answers. It seemed like you'd have a, a, a almost a library of, of, Perfect examples of great dialogue. I think you got to be honest with yourself, and I don't. I don't think I would do that well at that. So I don't. I don't want to succumb. And I, I'm happy doing the nonfiction book. Well, we're happy you're doing nonfiction you. too, of course. So when uh, I've got a question here about so about me too and. Is there a change? The question is, now that this has been exposed publicly and coupled with Me Too, do you think that things, and that is news organizations, ethics, et cetera, have actually changed? Or is this considered just a passing event? Who do people in Hollywood now fear? I mean, certainly the people in Hollywood fear being caught 
or being embarrassed, shamed, uh, doing something untoward. So I think certainly in the short run, there's less, less sexual abuse in Hollywood. You have to remember one of the things that's, that's unusual about Hollywood, you, you in the insurance business and the automobile business and most businesses, you don't have attractive, young, ambitious women working side by side with powerful producers, directors, studio heads. And, and you walk into to a studio office and you see 25, 26 year old woman and, and dressed to the nines and, and very attractive. And, and if you think with the wrong part of your anatomy, as many of these narcissistic men do, um, you, you, you think that's a license to, to abuse these women. I think there's less of that, certainly in the short run. And I think there's less of that because in the short run, at least, the press is focused on exposing it and writing about it. Whether that will be true in the long run, I, we don't know yet whether that, that will happen. But so far, it, it's been positive. But one of the negatives that happened, I think Me Too has been a tremendous plus, but there's a negative to it too, which is that we, we tend too much to group everyone into the same category as Harvey Weinstein. And, and, and people who, who sexually harass women didn't rape women and, and, and they shouldn't be judged in the same criminal sense that Harvey Weinstein is, A. B, if you believe in, in giving a pardon to people, and, and who prove that they've learned something, they've reformed, they're better. Be, it they, be they prisoners or forgiveness, which is something we do in church all the time. Then you have to be willing to say, hey, you did a terrible thing. You, 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 you were a selfish person. You abused that woman emotionally. Um, you, you, you sexually harassed that woman. You didn't rape them necessarily. And if you can prove that you're, you feel guilt, you feel sorrow, you've reformed yourself, um, then you have to be willing to give people a pardon and be generous about that. And I don't think we give pardons. To, you think about who, who has come back after being accused of sexual abuse in our society? Well, you could argue Donald Trump was after those tapes came out in, in the, in 2016. You could argue that Bill O'Reilly, even though he was fired from Fox News, is the number one best-selling author, right. book after book. So he's, he's kind of come back. But very few people have, uh, some have gotten jobs and, and, and but generally it's, it's a scarlet letter. And Louis C.K., you know, who publicly admitted the comedian, you know, what he did, um, I don't know what's going to happen to. Um, well, he's performing. He in, is, yes. In nightclubs, but he's not the esteemed. He doesn't have the right. kind of audience he once had. But he right. he's come back more than 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 most have. Right, and I and Bill Cosby. I don't. I you know there was a documentary that came out uh, last year. We have to talk about Bill Cosby. You know, it was really about the African American communities really grappling with the unraveling of his public persona and the women who came forward. Right. So is there there are a lot of discussions about uh, forgiveness um, and and redemption and guilt and an, another you reminded me of a book by John Ronson called You've Been Publicly Shamed. He's a, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's out of Great Britain and he's done a lot of radio, but he wrote this book to explore U.S. culture of publicly shaming, a lot of it on social media or something, making it to social media and then humiliating somebody and what happens and what's the real, very nuanced and contradictory story behind a lot of these incidents or issues so you've had a tremendous amount of experience in looking at taking the approach of, I'm trying to understand. 
and th those are your words prior to prior to starting um, the event, you know, trying to understand. And that's why people will talk to you because you're not going at them. And it's really hard kind of prosecutorial approach. When you, was there anything that you felt like demanded a harder approach or maybe a different approach as someone who's such a skilled and admired interviewer, any, any regrets? No, I mean, I, th there, it depends on the person you're reporting on. With Harvey Weinstein, uh, I was very tough with him in the end. I mean, in the beginning, you're sitting there and you're trying to get him to open up and understand him and you're talking about his childhood and everything else. But in the end, when I confronted him, I thought we were going to have a fist fight when I confronted him in 2002 about Rowena Chu. Um, so he was enraged. And, and the profile I wrote, he was enraged by that. He thought it was very unfair to him because it portrayed him as, as abusive to people. And I knew that the abusive behavior was very much consistent with the sexual abuse he was visiting on people, but I just couldn't prove it. And we've got a question here uh, from the audience uh, about the enablers who surrounded him, many of them women. Uh, were you able to speak in depth with Barbara Sch Schneiweiss, one of Harvey, Harvey's big enablers? And what are your views on her, whether or not she had knowledge of what Harvey was doing? And were you surprised that she wasn't called to testify in the first criminal trial? I, I was surprised and asked the prosecution, how come you didn't call Barbara Schneeweiss? Schneeweiss was a fascinating character to me. There were, one of the things when you, when you cover a trial, you get all this, now all this email evidence, you know, that's, which is a treasure trove for me as a journalist. And the Barbara Schneeweiss evidence in this trial was so incriminating to her. She was his chief enabler and, 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 and she protected him and, and, and for him, kept in touch with the women, tried to placate them with, they seemed upset, tried to give them a sense that they would get a job for Harvey after he had abused them. So he, she was a, a chief enabler. I confronted her. She would not talk to me. Her lawyer then sent me a scathing note saying you may not use it. But I had all this email evidence from the trial. I mean, it was just about what she had done, emails that she was writing these women who Harvey had abused. So she was, I wish she had talked, but I, I consider Shani Weiss one of the prime enablers for Harvey. Was there someone akin to her that you, you wanted to kind of get on the record and also wasn't able to get to speak to you that you'd like to, to mention? Well, I mean, I, I wrote it, many names I, I name in the book, uh, Steve Hutensky was Harvey's business affairs guy and his lawyer who who went over to London to try and squelch the Rowena Chu, Zelda Perkins incident from the Venice Film Festival in 1998. And I confronted him and he, again, like Schneeweiss's lawyer, came at me and, and I, I, you know, I had, the, I have Harvey's non-disclosure agreement that he made with these two women. He paid them roughly $250,000 each for their silence. But in the non-disclosure agreement, it identifies Steve Hutensky as the person, if you want anything from me, if you want a job, you have to go to Steve Hutensky. And then they described in the multiple interviews I did with them what his role was. So I think of someone like that as another prime enabler of Harvey Weinstein. And then there's the the use of this kind of shady investigative, I'm trying to, Black Cube, am I remembering that? that Ronan Farrow exposed that, yes. That is, that was a real surprise to me. And I wonder what your, your reaction to that was, because that is a level of surveillance of, in, of private individuals that I did not anticipate that was a part of this larger story. When Harvey in 2017, as, as his defenses were crumbling and he knew that the Times and Ronan Farrow and others were, were going after him, he, he hired Black Cube, the security firm made up of many ex-Mossad 
agents from Israel. And, and Ronan Farrow, for instance, uh, writes about how he was tailed. When I called him on August 9th to find out how his meeting with the head of NBC News went, he said, Ken, can I call you back from a secure phone? And I thought that was really odd. And what I learned later in talking to him and reading what he wrote about Black Cube, he knew his, his phone was being tapped. And, and he knew people were outside watching his building. And, and these people, Harvey was paying a lot of money to these people to track down and pretend to be, in some cases, pretend to be a journalist right. in order to get them to, the, you know, what have you got to try and divulge what they were working on? And in the end, the dam broke and he couldn't, he didn't have enough fingers to plug all the holes. Right. Well, as a journalist, what do you what do you think of that level of surveillance and attempt to intimidate or suppress news? I mean, we we we've heard of examples of this in other areas. Have you experienced it? And is there a larger story there too about the intimidation of journalists that you think is important to tell? Oh, I think it's very important and scary and and People, and, you know, by the way, you have an ability of people to to basically get on your email accounts and and track you without you knowing it. Get on your cell phone and track you. I remember when I was writing about about uh, the Guardian's reporting on on national security issues. And I went over there to do I was a story and and they said, you can come up to the room where our computers are. And we'll we'll show you how we wrote about Snowden and and all that. And I got up there, and they said, "Take your cell phone and any electronic equipment out of your pocket and leave it in the basket here, and then you can come in." And when I came in the room, they were using they weren't on the internet. They had all, you know, they were well protected. I said to the editor of the Guardian, I said, "So." why can't I take my phone in, in here? Why is the phone left outside? And they said, because people can track, can open your phone and make it a recording device from afar. And that's, technologists can do so many things that we never imagined they could do remotely. And, and those tools are frightening for journalists. I mean, if you're a powerful person with lots of money, you want to know what that investigative journalist is up to, what information they have. And if you can get that information and, and you're so desperate because you feel the information could ruin your life and your career, you, you'll pay to get it done. And, but that endangers journalism and therefore endangers the public's right to know. I'm thinking about, uh, we're almost at the top of the hour. So I hope that if you have uh, questions for Ken, you'll, get those to us. Uh, Ken, I'm thinking about Chelsea Manning, who just published uh, her memoir, uh, readme.txt, and discussing some of these things that you're talking about, the, what she knew in trying to get, you know, the, leak that video, leak those documents, that information uh, to journalists and moving around a mall circling a mall to get good Wi-Fi. What do you think, you know, you've been at this business uh, for a long time. What, what have you learned that you try to impart through your work and, and, and as a journalist? What do we need to be aware of as people consuming journalism today? And what about the journalists who are coming up? Well, one of the things that, has had a, a profound effect, negative effect on journalism is the claims about fake news. And, and, and if you go to a rally, a particularly Republican rallies more than, more than Democratic rallies or Trump rallies, you know, they, they literally are pointing fingers at the press um, talking about the, that's the fake news. Those are evil people and stuff. And that's scary. Uh, physically, I mean, many reporters who cover campaigns are literally frightened that something's going to happen. Someone's going to shoot them. Someone's going to beat them, not just verbally arrest them. But, and, 
And but it also means that that people become if they think you're fake news, they're not going to talk to you. So you you're not getting information that the public you think has a right has a right to know. Now, does the press bear some blame? Uh, the answer, of course, the press bears some blame. I mean, we we too many gotcha questions, too many arrogant reporters, too much opinion uh, as opposed to reporting. But essentially, the press plays a very fundamental role in our society. So when when I watch a, a, a candidate for office then say that you're fake news or refuse to acknowledge, as I believe Ms. Lake, who's running for governor and apparently lost in, in Arizona, still has not acknowledged she lost, as Trump didn't acknowledge he lost in, in 2020. And that's really scary. Uh, and many Republicans have said it's really scary. And, and elections in a democracy matter. And you win some and you lose some. But you got to accept the consequences. And when you see people not accepting the consequences, um, you're undermining democracy, you're subverting democracy. So is that is that the bad news? Is there any good news out there? Yeah, I think good news, if you look at this election, d- despite you know the criticism uh, fairly about inflation and, and crime, um, and the, the thought that Democrats would get killed in the midterm elections, because it, there's evidence from polls that the voters were, even those, though those issues really mattered to them and concerned them, and they were angry about it and angry at, at Biden administration. Nevertheless, they were more angry at those who would subvert democracy and would would not ex- make it all about what happened in 2020 and that election shouldn't count. And, and so it was really a vote for democracy by people. Um, and, and I think that there's some truth to that. And there's and there's some there's there's some something very wonderful about that and, and inspiring about that. That the public, despite legitimate concerns. Uh, was sending a message to politicians, accept the results of elections, stop the brutality, the verbal brutality that is going on. Well, I know you said your next project is incubating and we're at the top of the hour. So I'll honor everyone's time. Ken Oletta, it's a privilege to have you on a virtual author event at Malaprops. I want to thank you for accepting that invitation and for letting us share just a little bit of your stardust and your time uh, working on the Harvey Weinstein story and for helping us understand this culture of silence a lot better. I want to thank you for your time this evening. Thanks, Patricia. Enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too.